All right. Welcome to our discussion on chapter five, the hypothesis tests with means of samples. If you have started reading the chapter, you know it is very technical. Um, it is okay to watch the lecture video before you do the chapter. I'm going to try to give you some context for why we are doing this. I'm going to try to put this into some easier to understand everyday language. Um, I've actually spent quite a bit of time going through and comparing the way that our stats book for this class teaches this topic compared to how some other stats books do, just to try to um, get some ideas for how to best and most simply explain this. I'm going to teach you an alternate formula for part of it that I think your book makes too complicated, to be perfectly honest. Um, we're going to work through some of the examples in the textbook together so you can see step by step what's going on. So we will get started with a discussion of why we do this. I don't know how many videos is going to be in this unit. I'm just going to try to explain it. This is a difficult concept, largely because you, you, you use a lot of theory with it. And by theory, I mean not real statistical procedures, right? To discuss this, we're doing a lot of mental gymnastics with numbers that aren't actually real. Do not let that intimidate you. It's not that hard once you get the hang of it. Um, th this is one of those things that I think that the book makes it a lot trickier than it needs to be. I mean, it's, it's not easy, but it's also not impossible. Okay. Everyone in this class was capable of doing this. I promise. Let's start with a recap of what exactly it is that we're doing here. Okay. If I want to show, I'm, and I'm going to return to that example I used in the last unit of, of my meditation app for anxiety insomnia a few times, just to be consistent with the wording um, that I laid out last time. If you have no idea what that example means, you'll pick up on it pretty quick. Um, so where was I? Um, so why, why we're doing this? Remember when we are, let's zoom out to big picture here. Okay. The purpose of statistics in behavioral sciences, we want to see if interventions work. We want to see if there's trends based on demographics, right? I want to know if I have you meditate before bed, is that going to help your insomnia? I want to know if I make more three day weekends throughout the school year, will that lower levels of student stress, right? I need to have some way to actually turn this into a number so I can calculate it so that I can say, oh, hey, I added two more three day weekends and the students weren't as stressed out that I know that it wasn't just a coincidence, right? That I know that what I did had an effect. Um, if I propose that walking your dog every day lowers the amount of stress and I have a group of people that starts walking their dog every day, I need to know that the thing that I proposed made a difference did, and that there wasn't just some random chance that okay, yeah, that group ended up lower, but you know, you probably could have gotten that answer by coincidence anyway. It wasn't that much lower. I need to have ways to compute these, okay? So that that is the big picture of what we're doing. We're talking about if I propose an intervention, if I change something, if I compare test scores, what is the likelihood that the thing that I did actually made a difference versus, okay, that, yeah, maybe there, the numbers were a little different, but it was just by chance or the null hypothesis. My group that I messed with wasn't actually any different than the bigger population. That's what we're doing here. So keep that in mind. Okay. Because keeping that bigger picture framework of what we're using these numbers for is going to keep all of this so much more clear as we go through this conversation. We'll pick up with part two.